Hi everybody, it's Mind Rolling. Raghu, I'm back. Back with somebody who I've known about for a long time and we have a lot of mutual friends. And uh, his name is MC Yogi. MC Yogi, welcome. Thanks for having me, Raghu. Uh, and MC has, uh, uh, aside from some great music, uh, very uh, unique music, by the way, um, in terms of he does uh, you know, some really cool hip-hop stuff all around, but with a spiritual base. And for those of you who don't, you know, MC Yogi, I think what I need to do first off is, is play something. So Go everyone it, gets man. an idea. You know, I love that breathe thing uh, that you do, and the video is fantastic, too. Oh, thanks, man. Um, yeah, it's an interesting thing, the way, not just the rapping, which is fabulous, and the music, and the way it carries you, but also the fact that it, it's a little bit of a, a spiritual exercise, really. I mean, I myself have done some three-minute breathe pause meditations, <laughs> you know, so... Uh, it's really cool. So everybody, here it is. Um, listen to this for a bit. Breathe. MC Yogi, that's the the uh, song that we really appreciate. Although I want to play another one later on, MC, uh, uh, that uh, we'll talk about because I want to introduce it. It's really also something I think really important for people to connect with. Um, but while we're at it just now and before we get into anything, uh, people are going to go, okay, how do we get this? Is it from an album? What's What's the latest album? 
Well, the, the actually the latest project was uh, I just finished a book, so that's my that's my big project that just came out. I, right, I, we're going to talk about that. Yeah, for sure. The last album was a a, a collaboration I did with a friend of mine named East Forest, who lives up in Portland, Oregon, and it was the song "Breathe Deep" is on there. It's called "Ritual Mystical," and it was sort of an ambient, down tempo, mm. kind of more chilled, laid back sort of project to you know because it was right around the time of the election and a lot of stuff was sort of building up and so we wanted to put out some music to help everyone just like stay calm <laughs> and stay focused on what's real yeah. well we, we yes okay i'm then this highly recommended and of course everybody out there you can get that on itunes you can get that on amazon and so on so uh and we'll have it all up on our uh on the landing page on mind rolling on be here now network.com. So you can check everything out and get links. So now to the book, I had a fun read with this book. Oh, did you, you read it already? Of course I read it. How could I do this <laughs> podcast with you if I didn't read the book for God's sake? Uh, well, you know, some people, some people have been listening to the, um, the book on tape, Yeah, but, but I recommend everyone to get the tape on book. <laughs> uh, because there's something kind of cool about if you flip through the book you'll see a lot of the illustrations that i i hand drew and oh you did those i was wondering yeah. i love those man oh those so that's really... my that's my yeah that's my favorite part when i was growing up my dream was to become uh like a cartoonist oh yeah or a comic book, uh, illustrator oh, wow so it was fun being able to make those anyhow this book everybody's called spiritual graffiti and um it's it's really the core is uh, MC Yogi's transition uh, from um, a bunch of trouble. He got into a bunch of trouble. So did I when I was your age. Maybe I didn't go as far as you. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, and, and the transformation uh, in this book is uh, just absolutely gorgeous. And I think will help a lot of people who, uh, who you know have a hard time growing up. Growing up can be a bitch, you know, and we all know yeah. that. And in, in my own case, I was a really unhappy teenager. And um, it uh, for me, it took music. To, it just, like you, I mean, it took music to get me out onto the, uh, to the realization that there could be a path to happiness. And, of course, eventually Eastern spirituality. But, but you tell us a little bit about some of the tough stuff that you went through as a kid. And growing up, well, when I was growing up, I was uh, I was suffering from a lot of depression, anxiety, stress. Um, I was failing through all my classes. I think I was there at one point. I was like straight Fs, even in art, which was <laughs> bad because I was an artist. And um, and then I was getting kicked out of every school I went to. I, I got kicked out of three schools. I was getting arrested a lot. Um, I was painting graffiti a lot. Um, because I had turned toward hip hop as a as an outlet to express myself, and actually hip hop was a really, like you were saying, how the music kind of helped to carry you through some difficult times. Hip hop became a real positive force in my life, and it and it kind of helped me connect to a community of artists and dancers and MCs, poets, DJs. Um, so that was like a little bit of light um, during those sort of early years. But then at the same time, I was still struggling with a lot of you know, drugs, alcohol, violence, uh, some gang related stuff. And, and it wasn't until I was about probably 14, 15, where it got to a breaking point. And I ended up um, getting sent to live at a group home for at risk youth for about two and a half years. And um, that was another um, turning point for me because it helped to create some discipline and structure because my parents were divorced and I was kind of falling in between the cracks. I didn't have a lot of, um, stability or routine and so my life just was spiraling I was getting more wild experimenting with crazier things and um, you know a lot of my friends ended up spiraling out of control committing suicide overdosing on drugs some dropped out of school um, and some ended up in prison some in juvenile hall so all around me all the kids were kind of my good friends uh, were ending up in you know, even worse situations. In fact, I had one, one of my best friends was on the FBI's, I think top 10 or top 20 most wanted list in California. Oh, oh so, so, you know, we were getting into a lot of trouble and 
um, I didn't really know about yoga. Uh, I had sort of maybe heard something about the Buddha at some point in my life. I think when I was in the group home, my, mo- my mom gave me this really pivotal book. And I'm a big believer in the power of books to help you, you know, literally turn the page in your life. Like sometimes books literally fall off the shelf and land in your lap. And they, you know, they, it, that happens for a reason and for a purpose. And one of these particular books in my life was um, Siddhartha by Herman Hesse. Mm. Um, and when my mom gave me that, that was like the, my, the first time I'd really um, heard or uh, it got exposed to Eastern philosophy and spirituality and learning about the Buddha. And then I was a big fan of um, certain hip hop groups. And one of them was the Beastie Boys. And one of the members of the group, MCA became involved in Tibetan Buddhism and he had put out this song called Bodhisattva Vow. So that kind of reinforced this, you know, this, um, this sort of this desire to learn more. Uh, And then they had, you know, they had a track called Namaste on one of their records. So I was sort of slowly getting introduced to yoga and spirituality through hip hop and and my, you know, I was painting graffiti and, and running around doing all kinds of crazy things. But when I started to lean towards spirituality, it was, um, it took a while. But then finally, when I was 17, I found out that my dad had been practicing yoga. And that's when I got to my first class, got hooked. Things started to change very rapidly from that point. So I was about 17 and everything in my life, um, it was a huge dramatic shift from, from darkness to light. Um, and so that's kind of what the book, essentially what the book is about is that journey, that arc of going from confusion and chaos, not having a direction or a purpose in your life to discovering what my path was, which was yoga, music, and art. Mm. And there's one little chapter, not little, but one chapter, and this may be something that people would miss or even misconstrue, but to me it meant a lot. And and that chapter is all you need is one yeah. good friend. I mean, yeah, that's a good one. Talk about that. I mean, that's highly crucial as far as I'm concerned. All you need is one good friend. I think one of the things that I've learned um, through my yoga practice, which is I've been practicing now for close to 20 years, and one of the things that yoga has taught me is how to be a better friend and the way to become a better friend to someone is to really truly be a better friend to yourself and to really treat your body like it's your friend to treat your mind like it's your friend um, to really approach everything with this spirit of friendliness and kindness and appreciation and before i had that realization there were certain people in my life who kind of carried that torch for me when I was lost and they kind of showed up in a really beautiful, powerful way that kind of kept me going when I didn't really have a direction. Uh, In that particular chapter, it was one of my friends from back in the day, my good friend, Swanee, who we grew up together. And he was always encouraging me and rooting me on and protecting me and supporting me as a brother. And uh, we got into a lot of trouble together. We had a lot of adventures together, but um, you know, he was always there for me and, that chapter in particular is all about, you know, this one moment in my life where I was sort of, uh, it was kind of, it was a, it was an interesting thing about how I ended up on, on a stage for the first time with a mic in my hand as an MC. And it was really because of him that he kind of like gave me permission and, and kind of what just with his love and his friendship kind of like gave me the, the, the wind and the breath to do it. So that's a, that's a fun chapter. Mm. Yeah, and I think everybody needs that too. Everybody needs somebody that you can feel is supporting, especially in formative years like that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We all need we all need a good friend. Yeah. Um. And then, you know, as you said before, and you mentioned something that I I completely agree with you. Books can be very important. I mean, as you know, I'm involved with Ramdas and. Uh, have been for it, that was another great uh be here now landed on my oh yeah uh, on my 21st birthday and it was given to me by a woman who was a caretaker for my grandparents when they were um uh, uh they were suffering through my grandfather had dementia um uh, 
And I was there for the last years of my grandfather's life. In fact, when he passed, I was at his bedside um, chanting mantras and his last breath blew across my face. I was, there was only a couple people in the room and I was there when he left his body. Mm. And um, this one woman, Shirley, we call, called her Big Cheryl. She was a big lady, not just physically, but spiritually. She had a huge heart. And um, Shirley, she gave me this book on my birthday. And when I opened up, I said, be here now. And what I loved about that book so much was all the illustrations. And it was kind of abstract. It was like very poetic. It wasn't linear. Mm. It was chock full of all these sort of spiritual gems and jewels. Um, and the story of Neem Karoli Baba and uh, Ram Das. I just, uh, that was a real pivotal part of my, um, of my path. Mm. Now, uh, Raghu, could I tell you one more book that, w- that kind of fell into my world? Yeah, yeah. And that's autobiography of a yogi. I was just going to bring that up because yeah. we're we're on the same page there. That happened to me as well. But go ahead. Well, that that book was really that book lit me up uh, like no other book had before, because all of a sudden I started to uh, perceive these yogis and these mystics as superheroes with these incredible sort of psychic abilities um, and powers that they could you know, escape jail with and, you know, like avoid tigers with and, you know, all these incredible tales. And when I got Autobiography of a Yogi, that was like, there was no turning back for me after I read that book. (laughs) So when I read that book, I read it before, maybe around the time I met Ram Dass in the late 60s. And uh, so I read that book and it was like, Right. It's like, enter as you just said, it's like entering into another planetary zone yeah, of celestial. these beings. Yeah. That, wow, could they really exist? You know, I was just so fascinated and, and just so drawn to it. And it also gives you, this is a great book, everybody out there. I don't know if I've mentioned it before. This is Yogananda's book, Auto, Autobiography of a Yogi. And, um, it gives you also the feel of the holiness of in India, just the ground. You've been yeah. there, I think, right? Well, yeah, I know you have because oh, I yeah. read the book. In, yeah, you've been there a number India of times. Yeah. I'll yeah. be going back next year, too. Uh-huh. Yeah. So, as you know, you just get off that plane and take one whiff of the air as you get out the airport, and it's like, oh, God, yeah. Well, here's the thing I learned about India is you can leave India, but India will never leave you. Uh, you know, once you mm-hmm. go there, it's like passing through a threshold, and um, especially when you go on a pilgrimage and, and go to some of these temples. I remember I was in one temple on the banks. Um, I think it was on the Gadarvi River. There was, we, we were traveling all around and there's and there been to many temples, you know, many temples. And, but this one temple in particular, I just felt like this magnetic pool. And, and my wife and I, we went inside and, to make an offering, some flowers, incense and candles and uh, there weren't many people in the temple. And when you walk inside the stone, it's really hot in India and the, the stone of the temple was very cool. So a lot of people, you know, some older people and some sadhus and just people taking refuge in the shade um, of the building. And as I walked in, there's this beautiful sort of altar or puja. And um, I went up to get the darshan or to like to have the vision of the, of the altar. And, and as I walked up, you know, I felt this huge, warm gust of spirit, like a, like a rolling wave just wash over me. And it was heavy. It was like gravity. And uh, I started to swoon and Amanda saw me and I was kind of swirling and, and I reached out to clutch the, um, the guardrail. And I just felt like this huge, um, energy coming off this tiny stone. And, and later I realized that, you know, people have been pouring their love and devotion and adoration and respect and prayers and offerings and blessings and attention and energy and awareness into this tiny little rock. And it was like, it was like a satellite, like it was transmitting all this power. And um, after I had the darshan, the priest kind of like knocked me on the head or whatever and pushed me over so to keep it moving for the next person. And I just kind of like stumbled and sort of gathered myself up. And then we went and just sat. Uh, next to some of the people from the village and just meditated for like an hour or whatever. And I'll never forget, like, it's amazing. Certain temples, like they're, they're different, you know, it's like, there's a, there's a different presence depending on like what's happened in that space. 
and uh, that one in particular really sort of blew me away. Who who was it a representative? Which god? Do you remember? It was a, a it was a Shiva temple. Shiva. Uh-huh. So it was um, a linga maybe. Yeah, and there was a. I mean, we've been to a lot of the different Shiva sites like in Benares and mm. uh, but this was just a this is just a little temple like it wasn't like a big tourist site right. or anything like that yeah, yeah. that's the case <laughs> a lot of yeah. the time yeah um, back back to uh, autobiography of a yogi uh, I wanted to just tell you that after I did the read the book of course I went to India followed Rambas back when he went back the second time because I wanted to meet Neem Karoli Baba and finally got up there and did, and, and lived in India for about a ne- year and a half at that time. And mm. I remember at one time, sitting just quietly somewhere, and the book came to me, just into my mind, Autobiography of a Yogi. And I went, holy shit, I'm actually living in this book now. <laughs> because of being with Maharaji, who was you know, the same as uh, some of these great uh, masters that are in that book. But I like what, what so in this, in this particular chapter, anyhow, you go on and say the deep effect that book had you, uh, got you into a, a, a quite a different place, and you, you kind of became a little bit monk-like, you said, and, uh, yeah. you know, and your diet changed, and you became a vegetarian, and I love this. He said, I even drank my own pee once because I heard some yogis <laughs> did it for medicinal for Yeah, how was that? <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny because I wrote that that book and I was like, watch, the only thing that anyone remembers yeah, from that right, whole book seemed, absolutely, that I drank yeah. my own pee. Yeah. <laughs> but wouldn't it, wouldn't it be horrible if I, if I had done that and then someone was next to me and told a joke and I sprayed it into their <laughs> face? With it? Oh, shit. <laughs> no, um, you know, that was at an early phase of my life when I was experimenting with a lot of the practices. Um, another practice that I did was um, every Monday for a year, I, I kept silent. Uh, and that was inspired by Gandhi's practice of not talking on Mondays. Mm. And, and, you know, I'd do, and I'd go for like long walks by myself or I'd walk like, tw- you know, 20, 30 miles at one, one time. And um, just like I was in that zone of wanting to really understand and, and have a direct experience of of what a unified vision is of the universe where everything is interconnected and mm. and you know there's that that power that light is flowing evenly through everything that current um you know and hence the breathing and and so when i was doing those early experiments like i was really um i felt like i was being catapulted into a whole nother dimension and a lot of my friends couldn't really relate. Uh, a lot of the kids I'd grown up with, they they kind of felt like I had gone off the deep end, like I was sort of different. I changed. Um, I wasn't into like doing drugs and partying as much. And um, yeah, so that was a huge turning point. And there were certain stepping stones along the way, like certain encounters with, with different teachers, um, different books, different songs uh, that kind of kept, moving me deeper and deeper and further and further Um, and then at a certain point I had to kind of bend back and be able to integrate it all back in Mm. so that I could sort of function in society because I'm not a you know I'm not a monk I'm not a sadhu I'm a householder I'm you know I'm married you know I'm a musician I travel I perform I have I've had a yoga studio that I've been running with my wife for the past 16 years called Point Rays Yoga up in Northern California Mm. you know like I'm a you know I'm a business owner I'm a, you know, I'm my own record label at this point. Like there's so much that I'm doing in the world. So I had to figure out how to integrate all those teachings and tools back into everyday life. And it's an ongoing process. Um, But I am truly grateful to the practice and to my teachers because I I don't think I'd be here if it weren't for them. Mm. I can relate with the ongoing process, MC Yogi. Yeah, that's the human, the human part. Yeah, you know? that's we're human, and that's yeah. that's a big deal about how we're going to do it, how we keep this thing going, and how we function on multiple planes at once. That's probably the yeah, biggest that's right. challenge. But one of the things you say here is uh, through through these through the exposure you had to yoga, to Eastern spirituality, to the books that we've been talking about. It, you say it helped manage my mind and take care of my body. It's a throwaway kind of line, but everybody out there, you know, I mean, I've been um, 
sharing this kind of this exact thing we call it life in balance how do you get your life in balance and by by taking on these practices and reading these books and uh, immersing yourself in a in a lifestyle that is more conducive to managing your mind and your body uh, that that life in balance starts to happen so uh, I think yeah really all important. the all the practices I think at their core are, are centering um, and instead of being self-centered it's centering into the self with a capital S mm-hmm. you know really moving the mind back toward the middle um, so that everything can start to level from there because if we're slightly off to the left or slightly off to the right it kind of throws everything out of whack um and lord knows i've experienced you know extremes on both sides in my time here on earth like i've had a lot of ups and downs um a lot of potholes and valleys and (laughs) uh, you know dark corners but the practice has helped me to to come back to center more and more so I could keep moving forward, which is really inward. Um, and so we have this concept of time, which is linear, but what I've discovered in my yoga practice is that, um, time is concentric, you know, it's like a spiral. It's like a circle. It's like, um, you know, sometimes I'll have intuitions or premonitions of things that haven't happened yet. Uh, or like I'll have a dream the night before, And then something will appear that day that kind of references the dream. And it's like, how do you explain that? And for me, it's because it's not a straight line. Like everything is curved and bent and connected and um, related. And so yoga helped me to become comfortable with that because I am not a linear person, so to speak. Like, you know, I'm an artist and a poet. And one of the reasons why I struggled so much growing up, because I felt like I was a square peg trying to fit into a round hole in school with religion, um, with authority figures, you know, just the man-made system that we have to navigate. And I always felt like it was being superimposed and it wasn't natural. Um, But then at the same time, like I have to respect boundaries and borders and rules and regulations, but I also have to be willing to know that if they're not true, they need to be broken. You know what I'm saying? So it's a, it's a dance. Yeah. It's a dance. Like there's certain things that are there to protect us and keep us safe. And there's certain things that are there to, to press us down and to keep us sort of dormant. And we have to work really hard to like shatter that, break out of that and, and free ourselves from ourselves. Yep. Today, a lot of stuff going on around yeah, just no this issue, huh? Yeah. So Yeah, a lot of projection. I think I think, you know, when you look at like missiles and bombs and um, weapons a lot of that is an externalization of a mindset of projecting you know it's like we you know and it's also has to do with security and and what does it mean to feel secure in yourself um and and greed you know and like we're dealing with uh you know natural resources and, and land grabs and like all these things were you know huge groups of people are trying to like encroach on other groups of people. And there's like, that's always a, a, a part of the human experience. Like we, we have to negotiate and figure out how to share space and work together. And it's never easy. It's always difficult because everyone has all their stuff, all their baggage that they carry with them. Um, you know, like the president now, you know, there's so much, um, just emotional baggage and, and unresolved trauma and stress and, you know, feeling unloved and not good enough and, and all these things that sort of bubble up and then, and then they flare out and it could be really dangerous and deadly because if we're not dealing with our issues and we're in a position of power, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it could be very, um, it can lead to a lot of violence and a lot of chaos and, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a moment in time where we really need some sober thinking and, and, and peaceful, nonviolent communication. And, and we need more adults right now. And it's kind of interesting with my generation and like the generation that's coming up. Like, I feel like when I look at the baby boomers and when I look at the generation before them, it just, I don't know, it felt like there was a lot more, um, a lot more responsive. They were more responsible. Like my grandparents, I felt like they were like salt of the earth. 
you know, they were reliable, consistent, worked hard, dependable. And then my parents' generation, I felt like they were really like um, pioneers in the sense that, you know, during the 60s, there was a huge sort of like shaking of the cage mm. to free everybody up from the confines. And now this new generation is like, we have to kind of figure out what our legacy is going to be because we're dealing with all this environmental uh, degradation and social media is causing a lot of um, confusion and havoc. So it's, I feel like it's time for this generation to really wake up and, and make music and make art and make poetry and make a, make, make a difference by using your voice to send a clear message about what it is that we stand for. Um, and there are people doing it, but we need more, hmm. you know, we need more. Yeah. I, but I think the other thing which this book represents quite a bit is, you know, when you're talking about your journey, it's your journey inward and yeah. that transformation. And I think, and, and of course, Ramdas talks about this all the time before you can do anything, to serve anybody, you've got to change your own heart. You've got to That's change right. your insides. And then you can reflect that one heart, one soul at a time. And I think that is happening, you know, with uh, this uh, millennial generation. Yeah. And maybe, you know, I'm just projecting, like, this is all my stuff. But, like, I think what, what we can learn this generation is if we really learn from our parents and our grandparents' generation. And we look at what they did right. Because, actually, if you bring those if you bring the lessons of our grandparents and our parents together and integrate that into our life, I think there's a, there's a real powerful force um, because, you know, you had the, you know, the, with the greatest generation, the world war two generation and the baby boomers. And the, to me, like the, I, I just learned so much from people who are older than me. And I feel like we need to get back to really respecting mm. people who are older than us, not just in age too, because there's a lot of older people who aren't mature or wise. We have to discern and understand that an elder is like a state of mind. It's like someone who's compassionate and kind and forgiving and honest and straightforward and clear. And I think, you know, we just, we need more elders right now. We need, we need people to really step up and, um, you know, it's an invitation yeah. to really step up and, and have your voice, you know, expressed right now because we need more, we need more clarity. We mean we need dignity and respect right now because yeah. we're kind of in that. Yeah, absolutely. True words. Um, this is th there's something in your book that uh, you tell this story that I know this story. I haven't thought about it in forever, and I'd love for you to tell this story. I think you'll remember, you, you won't be able to do it quite as uh, detailed-wise, but uh, this is the story of repeating Mara. Mara. Yeah. Tell yeah. that story. It's a great story because it does, That's it really uh, points to uh, the reality that if you're, uh, well, you tell the story and then I'll tell you what I think about it. Where the word Mara, as I understand it in Sanskrit, means murder or kill. Um also, the devil. That's right, Mara. It's like in the story of the Buddha, when he becomes awakened, he has to deal with his own Mara. Yeah. It, you know, that part of his psyche, which is really devilish. And, you know, it's we all have that. And that part of us demons, serves a yeah. purpose. Yeah, we all have our demons. Yeah. And we have to learn how to really sort of negotiate with our demons in order to, like, overcome our demons. So there was this great yogi um, who was wandering through the forest. And all day long, he was chanting, Om Namo Narayana, Om Namo Narayana. Everywhere he went, always singing, always chanting, lost in a state of ecstasy and bliss. And just his presence was exuding just pure cosmic love and, and beautiful energy. One day as he was wandering through the forest, he was approached by a, a kind of a haggard, old, disheveled um, thug who pulled out a knife and um, said, give me your money or I'm going to take your life. And this wise old yogi said, well, you know, I don't, I'm just a wandering mendicant. I'm a monk. I'm a sage. I have no money. Kill me. Go ahead. You can take my life. I don't mind. But all you'll be doing is generating and accruing more bad karma for yourself. And the thug kind of looked perplexed, like he'd never been sort of confronted in this way. And the yogi went on and says, I see that you're married. What does your wife and your family feel about your occupation? and what you're doing to make a living. 
And the thug replied, well, I'm doing it for them. Um, I'm sure they approve because I'm feeding them every night. So the yogi says, well, why don't you go back and ask them what they think about how you're making your living? So the thug goes back to his village and in his hut and he talks to his wife and and she says uh, something to the effect that there's no, I, I don't want I have nothing to do with what you're doing. You bring us food, that's fine, but that's your karma. I'm not taking on your bad karma. Same thing happens with his kids. So finally, the thug is like perplexed. He's like, he thought this whole time he was doing this to feed his family. And, you know, there was some part of him that was doing it for, you know, a justifiable reason. So he goes back to find the yogi and he says, oh, yogi, he's like, I've, I'm so confused. I thought that I was feeding my family and they were in support of what I was doing. And he said, the yogi said, look, if you want to turn your life around, here's what you need to do. I'm going to give you a mantra and I want you to chant this mantra until you realize the air of your ways. He says, but I can't give you a pure mantra because you're a, you're a murderer and a thief and a killer. And it wouldn't be right for you, for me to give you this auspicious mantra. So I'm going to give you a mantra it's called Mara, and it means kill or death or the devil. And I want you to chant it over and over again until you realize. And so the yogi th the, goes on his way, and the thug starts chanting this mantra, Mara, 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 over and over and over. Days pass, he's chanting it. Weeks pass, months pass, over and over and over on repetition, over, until finally anthills start to grow up around him. And he does this for years, decades. Uh, so many, many, many moons later, that same wise yogi is wandering through the forest and he hears this sound. And it's the sound Rama, 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 Rama. Mm -hmm. And it's coming from this mound, these anthills. And he's saying, what is that beautiful sound? And he goes over and he realized that the thug has been chanting Mara for so long that the mantra has morphed into Rama, which is the most beautiful mantra because it means the source of all pleasure all spiritual joy and bliss like a jewel and when he realizes that he kind of brushes off the 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 dust and the anthills and he says my friend you've done it you're awake you're realized and uh the thug presses his palms together and thanks the wise yogi and the yogi who happens says uh, i'm going to give you a new name valmiki mm. and Valmiki went on to be one of the greatest poet saints in the history of India. So uh, to me, it's a beautiful story of how even the worst case scenario through diligent effort and work can actually become a saint. There's an old saying in the, um, I believe it's in the Christian tradition. Oh, let's see. You still there, Raghu? Yeah, yeah. And it says every sinner has a future. Every saint has a past. Mm. so it's it's never too late never give up because mm. if you're willing to do the work yeah this you, there's amazing miracles that can happen in this lifetime yeah yeah and i i, I was, I was uh, gonna say before you told the story to me that story is also meant that it's about where th the practice that you do whatever it may be where is it coming from? Yeah. If, if it's, that's true. you can be given a, a mantra from a teacher that's not either, you know, simply not done, not cooked, or even one that's really gone to, into left field. And we have many of those in the West. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you are coming from the right place, from within inside yourself, it, will manifest itself in the name of Ram. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think that that story uh, really points to that. And I, I love that story. I'm glad you put it in the book, too. Yeah, um, thanks for reminding me. Yeah. So a big part of this book, though, is... Uh, not a, Well, certainly, it's a core part of the book, aside from your transformation and the incredible experiences and going over to India and meeting your... your uh, yoga guru, Patabi Joyce, um, there's the story of your coming together with your life partner. Which yeah, it's is a, a love very, story. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a love story. And I love that part of the story as much as I loved every, everything else. 
just uh, yeah, tell us a little bit about how that came together for you. Well, you know, earlier I was mentioning this the this power of like premonition and kind of knowing things before you know it. Yeah. And that was the case when my wife Amanda walked through the doors of the yoga studio in San Francisco where I was living and studying with my teacher Larry Schultz. And the moment she walked in the door, it was almost like a, a, a silent bell was ringing inside my heart. There was like some, you know, some kind of like f- some lights were flashing inside of me saying, pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. And I knew the moment that I looked at her that I was going to marry her. And there's certain things in the book that I share that kind of led up to that moment that were sort of some omens and signs along the way. And one of the things that I did is before um, I met and fell in love with Amanda, I was for the most part, pretty single. Like I was, I was kind of living like a monk and I was sort of holding back in a sense. Like I was kind of keeping to myself. Uh, and this is way before Tinder and, you know, all the social media platforms they have for meeting people. But when she walked in through that doorway, uh, there was some kind of like soul recognition where I, I recognize her soul. Now, I don't know if it's past life or destiny or it was like the constellations of events, but what it, for whatever reason I knew. And Amanda is an amazing artist. She's been in the process of painting 10,000 Buddhas all over the world through the, in the form of these beautiful murals. Uh, she's doing a lot of street art. And when I met her, I was a, painting graffiti around San Francisco. I was a graffiti writer. And one of the things that we loved to do was to just walk through the streets of San Francisco and go see art and listen to music. And uh, we just became really good friends and we shared a lot of the same things in common. We loved yoga. We loved music. We love art. And once there's some interesting things in the book, I don't want to give too much away away, (laughs) because there's some, there's some cool things in there that I think people really enjoy. Uh, But the long and short of it is that, we became friends first and we remain friends. And I really think that friendship is the foundation of any long-term relationship because we're all going to go through a lot of ups and downs. There's going to be a lot of change and transformation. You know, we're going to lose people we love. Family members are going to pass. Friends are going to get sick. Um, You know, there's all kinds of stuff going on in the world around us. But one of the things that I found is, is a steady consistent thread that keeps people close and connected is to just be a good friend and it's the thing going back to that first chapter you talked about in the book all you need is one good friend you know i can say wholeheartedly and with my bones and all my blood that amanda has been one of the best friends i've ever known on this path and she's Mm. been with me through so many things um so many like triumphant moments like being on stage performing to like 20,000 people, you know, having her there with me, you know, to like when my grandfather died and she was one of the few people in the room when he passed. And Mm -hmm. also my grandmother died. And, you know, I was there when her grandmother died. And, um, you know, we, we were there, you know, when our dog passed away, we held our dog together. And Mm -hmm. um, so just all these, these moments of transformation and just knowing that you have a friend on the path, to me, like all the other stuff kind of like pales in comparison. Like, you know, you can have the lust and the sex and all that is wonderful. And yeah, it's good to, to have like a sensual relationship. And, you know, we definitely have that as well. But the, the more important thing that's going to see any relationship through for a long period, what, what I've realized being with her is just that deep, profound um, commitment to being a friend to someone. Um, so she is definitely, um, I'm truly grateful for her. Yeah. And in the book, uh, I think this came from some friends in India, um, who, uh, gave you, uh, I think his Krishna's grandfather, I think. Yeah. And, um, I gave you seven steps of advice yeah. in, in a, basically a long-term relationship. And I, I won't give those away. I think that, everybody worthwhile getting the book just for these seven things. If you have any kind of relationship going on. Well, yeah. Anyone who's, anyone who's been to an Indian, Indian wedding 
or like a traditional Vedic like marriage. Actually, we we went through that process. We did the traditional marriage um, uh, ceremony. But anyone who's experienced that will know what these seven these seven yeah. things. Yeah, to help sustain a long long term relationship. Yeah, but what you just said uh, and pointed to, which is the friendship, and that is the seventh step: the friends in this world and the next. And um, truthfully. I'm happy I read this in your book. Mm. It was meaningful for me. I'm in it. Uh, my wife and I have been together now ten years, oh, and that's a, a m- m- very meaningful thing. We, you know, going through stuff. Yeah, we all go through it's easy, stuff. Easy, easy to forget that. Easy to forget that. So, um, another thing uh, and another book um, that struck me uh, that. Uh, I just uh, I know his importance to you, which is Gandhi and his autobiography, the story of my experiments with truth. I mean, the w- one of the primary, you know, Neem Karoli Baba Maharaji never taught anything. He did not give lectures. There's no books that he wrote. Nothing. He would just right. say spur of the moment kinds of things like Hanuman and Christ are one. There is only one. You know, stuff like that. Um, but he did talk about Gandhi, and mm. he, but what he gave us, uh, and Ramdas repeats this um, all the time: love everyone and tell the truth. Mm. Two uh, of the most difficult things possible, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and yeah. Ramdas would say, "Well, Maharaji." Uh, I you know I can't I can't love everyone and tell the truth. Ramdas love everyone and tell the truth until Ramdas finally came to the thing from his ego mind place it is impossible to do that. Mm. But from soul place that is where we can do that so it's obviously and he teaches these days about you know moving into that identification uh, through loving awareness but talk about and and by the way, we we spent time when we were with Maharaji in a meditation retreat. He sent us up into the, further up into the Himalayas. Uh, at a it was Gan, it was at Gandhi's ashram. I don't know if it's where he wrote this book. It's where he wrote one of his books. And we used to sit in his library. I mean, it was just like a, and look out the windows at the nine twenty nine thousand foot peaks, the whole horizon. I mean, it was insane wow. place and, and an insane time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I have we have this affinity with Gandhi as well. Well, who doesn't? I mean, that's a crazy thing to say, but still, it was effective for you. Talk about it. Well, Gandhi, to me, is a spiritual giant. Um, you know, similar to Dr. King or Swami Vivekananda or Neem Karoli Baba, um, and he's someone that I look to as um, as you know for inspiration. I don't I don't think that I could ever really come close to you know, what someone like that achieved in their lifetime and what he stood for and what he represented. And, you know, he was a controversial figure um, as every human being is, but the, eh. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, the, the, the level of dedication and sacrifice and commitment was just like second to none. It was just paramount. And I don't know, I, I, I there's certain people who, in my life, they're just like iconic, you know, like, um, you know, Bob Marley is iconic to me. Bruce Lee is iconic to me. Mahatma Gandhi, like these are people who just like, for whatever reason, they just stand out in their life, just leave such a long echo. And I think, um, was it Mark Twain who said that, you know, something to the effect that there'll come a time where we'll look back and we won't even believe that someone like Gandhi walked the earth. You know, um, and so, you know, as a young yogi, when I was, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, I, you know, I started to get into, you know, the teachings of Gandhi and the life story of Gandhi, and it really had an effect on me. Um, and it made me really interested in the ability for a person connected to a large group of people but still an individual, like what, what kind of change and what kind of influence can they have to make the world a better place? I don't think Gandhi was perfect. I think he did his best, but man, that level of just being all in, you know, 
like all into the point where like almost nothing else mattered. Um, and so deeply committed to his own personal practices, which were really like the fuel that kind of like made that massive light shine. You know, his practice of silence, his practice of nonviolence, his practice of being honest, of not demonizing the opposing side and not making enemies. I mean, just that alone. And that's just one thing, you know, yeah. but just that is so revolutionary. Uh, I mean, look, it affected, you know, Martin Luther King and, and you know, affected so many people. So, you know, I, I'm grateful that someone like that ever existed that we could look to, you know, and get some, some kind of inspiration to try to be better. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting how Maharaji says, love everybody, tell the truth. I like the order of that because he puts love everybody first. Mm. And I feel like even more important than speaking is just being in that soul place of really loving. And then I feel like the truth, the truth will come out. Like when you, when you're, like you said in the beginning of this interview, like it's not like what you're practicing, but the place that you're practicing it from And that place of coming from love and the soul and really, you know, shining from that place. I, I just feel like it's, you know, Gandhi called it soul force. And I think that's what allowed him to do those phenomenal things was to really, it, it wasn't just his mind because he talked about the still quiet voice within, which is the voice of intuition. Mm. And it wasn't just his body because he was a very frail, skinny old man. Um, some of his greatest feats were like in his sixties and seventies. And so there was a bigger power that was propelling and animating him. And it's what he called, you know, the, the power of the soul. And I think Maharaji Neem Kroli Baba, you know, knew that and experienced that. And there's many great luminaries out there who, who are tapped in like that. And I just think that is the unstoppable, unbreakable, undeniable, incorruptible, unforgettable force that really drives all, you know, evolution and change is that soul force. So I just really fascinated with that. Yeah. It's yeah. just so interesting to me. And I feel like all those people who I admire, Bob Marley, Bruce Lee, they all had that soul force, you know, yeah. it's interesting. Uh, and boy, do we need to apply some of what Gandhi had to offer, his teachings, his philosophy in these times, most so polarized that we are in. And we must stop the continue, continuation of that polarization by our reactivity. And, um, and I'm, a, I'm a prime offender, you know, what I see, and I'm, I, I immediately knee-jerk reaction to it. So I, I really do believe we should, uh, we should put more of our attention into some of the things that Gandhi has represented and enact them in our lives. I just had to, I just have to say that because I think it's really important. Yeah. It's important for me, and it's something I need to do. And I know I have brethren and sisters out there who also... Uh, it would be good if we enacted some of Gandhi's teachings. Okay, that's my it, little uh, that's preach good. thing for the minute. Um, uh, Can I share what one thing? That absolutely. Like a, a realization I had is that because um, you know I see you know I get the news feed on my phone and you know there's so much shocking news now and like it's every day you're sort of bombarded by all this just madness and and grown adults acting like children. And um, I think the thing that's, that kind of brings me back to center and keeps me connected to my practice and is sort of like a, a barometer or sort of, you know, my awareness and where I'm at is when I realize and remember that a lot of these people acting out, these world leaders, um, they're really coming from a place of tremendous suffering. You know, to be to be acting like this and to be perpetuating so much negativity in the world and so much greed, you know, and contributing to like starvation and, and planet, you know, the, the, you know, all this pollution, like it really, it, it must be a tremendous burden to bear all that sort of stuff inside your heart, you know, and, and so I feel like it's just there's a, there's a, there's a natural welling up when I, when I allow myself to feel into it, I feel compassionate for people mm. like, you know, because there's the karmic baggage is so heavy. It's like chains, you know, and to, and to not know how to shake off that, that those chains 
it's got to be just like hell, like a torment. Yeah. And so in, instead of like contributing to like beating people down even more who are already suffering, I feel like my work personally is like, how can I remember like what, what Neem Karoli Baba said is to, to love everybody and to tell the truth. Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah, I feel like compassion yeah. is really, that's, I, you know, my prayer is that compassion is always in fashion. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you got to do a, you got to yeah. do a song about that. That's for sure. Compassion we, is in fashion. Yeah. Um, we need more compassion. Yeah, yeah. Ramdas will talk about it uh, in the sense. Uh, we had a whole chat the other day, uh, wonderful uh, video podcast uh, around, uh, and, and he got around to talking, actually talking about Trump, and saying, you know. It's tough. Saying just what you just said. What a tough incarnation, a shitty yeah. incarnation that you got to have compassion for. And, and Neem Kroli Baba, when he says, love everyone, tell the truth, um, that second part is really important of telling the truth. But if you're not, if you're telling the truth without loving everyone, yeah. it's really, it's, it's, it could be really bad news because you could be creating more pain, more suffering, more torment, more right, stress. Exactly. Exactly. So if you come, you got to come from that place of being compassionate and loving everybody and then really having the balls to speak the truth, yeah. you know, tell it like it is, but it's got to come from a place of love. Otherwise it's going right. to, it's just going to contribute to more, more suffering. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so we're at the end of the, out of our show, so to speak. Our podcast. Okay. I really appreciated having you here, man. Uh, yeah, you know, we've, you know, we might, as I was mentioning to MC uh, before we got on, that uh, many years ago we did have a chat, many, many, many years ago, when he was just deciding to get into it and put put his music out. And I was in the music business, and a friend of mine said, "Hey, can we have a can you have a chat with him?" And just blah blah. Anyhow, it was uh, all those years later to see what you're doing. I so appreciate what you're doing. Of course, you're hanging out with some of my best friends out there, and I'm glad we finally got a chance to, to meet up. And uh, But I, I, um, I, we are going to put everything up on the page, as I mentioned early on, that will allow you all to get links to get the book and go through our Amazon portal, by the way. So uh, we're affiliate with Amazon. Just go to BeHereNowNetwork.com and Look at the uh, the support page, and you can just grab that link and bookmark it, and get MC Yogi's uh, new book uh, and and his music and his records. And also, there'll be a link. You know, what's your website? Uh, my website is mcyogi.com, and the name of the book is uh, Spiritual Graffiti: Finding My True Path. And there's a link on my website as well, mcyogi.com backslash book. And yeah. I post a lot of stuff on Instagram. Oh, cool. And, um, People can know, join so you there. We're going to put all yeah. of that up there so you can hang out with, with MC Yogi. But, uh, so uh, we can say goodbye, but you know what? After we say goodbye, I want to play the Gandhi song, okay? I have to do that. What's the name of the song, MC? So the song is called Be the Change. If you want to see the change, you got to be the change. Right, okay. So is that more, could it be more perfect? As an ending to what we've been talking about, I don't just, think so. I mean, that's exactly what we did. Yes. So, just the beginning. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining me on Mind Rolling. And Thanks, Raghu. So nice hanging out with you, man. Yeah. I'd love to get together with you. We'll meet up one of these days, I'm sure. I'm off to India next week, by the way. Oh, have a great trip, so, man. Yeah, I'm, I can't wait. Yeah, so it's going to be fun. So MC Yogi. On Mind Rolling, on the Be Here, Ram Dass' Be Here Now Network, go to BeHereNowNetwork.com, and we shall see you next week. Much love, everybody. Dedicated to all spiritual activists, true seekers, and peaceful warriors worldwide. I regard myself as a soldier, though a soldier of peace. 
Once upon a time, not long ago, there was a boy who would grow and become a great soul. He lived in India, and his name was Gandhi. He believed in human rights, and he fought for equality. He felt so strongly that he trained himself, cause he realized first he'd have to change himself. He changed his clothes and decided to walk. Some days he practiced silence and refused to talk. When he was young, he studied to be a lawyer, and then he became a great spiritual warrior. He read from the scriptures of every religion and came to the realization that we're all God's children. Because he understood that we're all equal, he became a spokesman for the people. A karma yogi, devoted to service, to spread truth and peace was his purpose. You gotta be the change that you wanna see in the world. Be the change, just like Gandhi. Be the change that you wanna see in the world. Just like Gandhi Gandhi dedicated his life to the cause Even when it meant breaking unjust laws He often faced prison and incarceration But that only strengthened his determination He said he would make every sacrifice But that he would never kill or take a life He used his heart instead of his fist And he taught non-violence as the way to resist A peaceful soldier who used his mind To fight for the rights of humankind But not just people, animals too In his basic teaching, God is truth he joined Muslims, Sikhs, and Hindus, Christians, Buddhists, Jains, and Jews. All the many paths that lead into the light that shines bright inside of me and you. You gotta be the change that you wanna see in the world. The change, just like Gandhi. Be the change that you wanna see in the world. Just like Gandhi. Be the change that you wanna see in the world. The change, just like Gandhi. Be the change that you wanna see in the world. Just like Gandhi. Gandhi taught an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind And it takes more strength and faith to be kind With that in mind, Gandhi took a stand Against the foreign occupation of his land When things got violent, Gandhi would fast Not eating for days until the riots would pass But the biggest event that made the British halt is when Gandhi G decided to harvest all The British Empire installed a salt tax And stealing salt was an unlawful act So Gandhi and his peeps took to the streets 10,000 deep, they marched to the beach But when they arrived, they were beaten with clubs But they didn't fight back, instead they chose love The foreign military realized they were wrong And eventually decided to go back home You see, Gandhi G was a very great leader But before all that, he was shy and meager as a young child, he was just like you and me Before he became Mahatma Gandhi The word Mahatma, it means great soul And it's inside of us just waiting to unfold If you follow your heart and act real bold Next time it'll be your story that's told You gotta be the change that you wanna see In the world, be the change Just like Gandhi Be the change that you wanna see In the world, just like Gandhi Be the change that you wanna see In the world, be the change just like Gandhi, be the change that you wanna see in the world. Just like Gandhi, be the change that you wanna see in the world. Be the change. Just like Gandhi, be the change that you wanna see in the world. Just like Gandhi, be the change that you wanna see in the world. Be the change. Just like Gandhi, be the change that you wanna see in the world. Just like Gandhi. Soldier, so a soldier of peace.